Matthew chapter 24, verses 35 to 36 and 42 to 44. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that if the good men of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore be ye also ready. For in such an hour as ye think not the Son of Man cometh. Like before these songs and for prayer and scripture reading this morning. And uh it is good to be here on this Lord's Day. We pray for those that are not able. Pray that Sister Ann will soon be feeling better and that uh, she will be able to be back with us. The fact that great lessons can and should be learned from trouble, trials, and tragedy is emphasized in the Word of God. For example, in the book of Job, the 14th chapter, verse 1, Man that is born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. Do you think that Job learned from the many trials and troubles that he had? There's no doubt about it. And I know one thing that we certainly can learn from them, from what he went through, as well as in our own lives. In chapter 42, we read the great statement that was made after all was said and done, in verse number 5, he said, I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eye seeth thee. He had a closer relationship with God and a clearer perception and understanding of God after all that he went through. Also, in the very first chapter of Job, in verse 19, And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young men, and they are dead. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. There one came to Job and told him about his sons and daughters who were in that destruction. And in Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verses 2 to 4, It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. For that is in the end of all for that is the end of all men, and the living will lay it to his heart. When we go to the funeral home or to a house, family, where death has occurred, we think about ourselves and that day that one day we will face. We will lay it to the heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, the wise man said, for by the sadness of the countenance the heart is made better. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. As you may realize now, I am building up to a lesson regarding the tragedy and trouble that many faced in this past week. We want to look at lessons learned from a tragedy, but not only this one, but from all the things that we go through in life. Do we step back after we've gone through a heartache, a disappointment, a trial or a trouble? Do we say, now what can I learn from this? What can I learn from it? I believe that we all should do that. That we should step back and see the spiritual lesson, the thing that will help us to be a better people after going through these things. This past week, there were lessons to be learned and things already known that man needs to be reminded of. We will say things this morning that we may already know, 
but certainly things that we need to be reminded of as Paul told Timothy to put the brethren in remembrance of these things. The tornadoes that struck between midnight and 2 a.m. from Nashville to Mount Juliet to Cookville indeed brought forth a great loss and tragedy to many people. Also, in this country and throughout the world, there are people now in fear of the coronavirus. They're talking about this. This is another thing. A case has been discovered just north of us. And so people are concerned about these matters. But I would like to say one thing, and that's in Psalm 48, verse 14. For this God is our God forever and ever. He will be our guide even unto death. He will be our guide even unto death. My friends, while we are alarmed and concerned about death, disease, and trouble, and tragedy, we as Christians should face the future without fear. For the Lord has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. God will give us his great peace regardless of whatever we're facing or whatever we have been through. As Christians, we can claim that because it's in God's Word. To be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. The first lesson we want to look at, and by the way, I'm sure there are many others that we won't even mention today, but the first one is that we need to be thankful for every day of life and use it each day, use each day to serve God and glorify Him. Each and every day is precious. This day could be my last or yours or all of us. It could be our last day. We need to use every day to God's glory and to do His will. In Matthew 5, 16, Jesus said, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. In John 9, 4, Jesus understood the urgency of doing God's will now because there is coming the night when no man can work. He said in John 9, For I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. That is, we will be in eternity. We will have no more opportunity on this earth to do God's will. In Ecclesiastes 12, verses 13 and 14, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man, for God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. And then in Ecclesiastes 9 and verse 10, Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave whither thou goest. Let us do what we can, while we can, that is pleasing to the Lord and a blessing to our fellow man. Secondly, when we think our problems are greater and feel sorry for ourselves, let us think of others. It's like the song we sang before the sermon. Count your many blessings. Name them one by one. And it will surprise you what the Lord hath done. You know, we go to bed tonight. Some people say you need to count sheep to help you go to sleep. Why not count your many blessings? Think about what God has done. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you, 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 18. We know that we as Christians are to be pitiful. Now sometimes we say, oh, he's so pitiful, or she's so pitiful, meaning that person is to be pitied. But the word pitiful in the New Testament doesn't mean that. It means that we are to be full of pity. We are to be full, full of pity. 
In 1 Peter 3, verse 8, Finally, be all of one mind, having compassion one of another, love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous. To be merciful, to be pitiful. What did Jesus say in Matthew chapter 5, verse 7? Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. You know, the Lord is full of pity. At the end of James chapter 5, verse 11, the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. The Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. What did James say in chapter 1? Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. James 1, verse 17. But then thirdly, another great lesson is that true greatness is in being a servant. It's not being served, but being a servant. Let's go over to the book of Matthew, the 23rd chapter. This is one of the profound teachings of Jesus Christ. To be humble and lowly servants. Matthew 23, verse 11 and 12. If we do this, the Lord will lift us up. If we do what he says here. Matthew 23, verse 11. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased. That is brought low, brought down. And he that shall humble himself shall be exalted, lifted up. James said, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. James 4.10 But God resisteth the pride but giveth grace unto the humble. James in chapter 4 and Peter in 1 Peter 5 tell us. You know, this past week we heard some very good stories about neighbors and friends and family helping one another and coming out immediately after this disaster struck. Many things that came out even on the news. The state of Tennessee was brought into a good light over the news regarding these matters. In fact, I believe it was a CBS correspondence that said he was impressed that most of the people mentioned God in what they said. They were not taking God's name in vain. He also mentioned seeing people carrying a Bible out of the destruction. They were carrying a Bible that had not been destroyed <coughs> and helping one another. In John 13, when Jesus stooped down and washed the disciples' feet in John 13, and the first few verses, in verse 15, he said, For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. And in verse 17, he said, If you know these things, happy are ye if you do. Who are the happy people? They are people who know how to serve, to be humble servants like our Lord. Matthew 20, verse 28, Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, that is to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. But then a fourth great lesson that we're all aware of, I'm sure, is the brevity and uncertainty of life. Life is very brief and uncertain. The wise man said, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. Proverbs 27 and 1. People may say, Well, I'm, I'm going to do this. And in so many years, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, without a thought about the Lord's help or His will. Look at James 4, beginning at verse 13. Go to now, ye that say, Today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. That sounds like people, doesn't it? They're going to make some money. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. But what did James say? Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. For that ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. That ought to be our attitude. That only with God's help and according to His will am I going to do this or that. Now we all as Christians ought to have that attitude. We're not going to find that in the world. 
should be seen in the church. Those who are in Christ. And then verse 16, But now you rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. You know, friends, any of us can leave this world at any time. And as Daniel read a while ago, the Son of Man may come at any time. But that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father which is in heaven. Matthew 24, verse 36. Uh, and so we don't know when that day is going to be. As he said, he said, but my Father only. Matthew 24, 36. In Hebrews 9, verse 27 and 28. And as is appointed unto man once to die, but after this the judgment. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Why does death strike such a blow in the hearts of many people? And I know that when we lose a loved one, that's heartbreaking to us. I understand that. But when we ourselves are facing death, and we look at it as a great devastation, that's not to the person that the Hebrew writer is talking about here. For the person who is looking for him, looking for Christ, it's not such a devastation to that person. Because that person is looking forward to going to be with the Lord. Like Paul said, my desire is to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Philippians 1, verse 23. Indeed, my beloved friends, the people who went to bed that night, Monday night, before the tornado struck in the wee hours of the morning, Tuesday after midnight, did they expect to die when they went to bed? Did they expect to lose a loved one or to be injured? Did they expect to lose everything materially? I remember when I was a little boy, my mother taught Jerry and I to pray that prayer. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. Now I'm sure some of you need that prayer too. We want the Lord to take our soul into eternity with Him. Because we do not know if it's when we go to bed or get up in the morning, we go out to work or to school. We don't know when that last time is going to be. We just don't know. But then, fifthly this morning, we need to be in a position to pray and to be heard of God. I know there have been a lot of prayers that go up in the last week. And we do need to pray for these people and all the suffering and grief and heartache and trouble that they're going through. We as Christians need to pray for all suffering humanity, especially those in the household of faith. We are commanded to pray one for another. But only God, God will only hear the prayers of the righteous. And that's not my opinion. That's what the book teaches. James 5, 16. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Now if I need prayer, who am I going to ask to pray for me? It's going to be <coughs> faithful children of God. 1 Peter 3, 12, For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open in their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. God heareth not the prayer of a sinner, according to John 9, 31. Over in the book of Jeremiah, in the 7th chapter, beginning of verse 13, And now, because ye have done all these works, said the Lord. These were not good works either, if you look at the context. And I spake unto you, rising up early and speaking, but ye heard not. And I called you, but ye answered not. Therefore will I do unto this house, which is called by my name, wherein ye trust, and unto the place which I gave to you and to your fathers, as I have done to Shiloh, and I will cast you out of my sight, as I have cast out all your brethren. 
even the whole seed of Ephraim. Therefore pray not thou for this people, neither lift up cry for prayer, nor prayer for them, neither make intercession to me, for I will not hear thee. There are many people that want God to hear their prayers, or they want God to bless them. But they're not willing to live for God. They're not willing to do His will. They want the Lord's help in trouble, but they don't want to do the Lord's will at all times. Is God going to hear their prayers? Is God going to bless them? Certainly not. We need to be in a position to pray. Those who need to obey the gospel of Christ or be restored to Him, they need to realize that until they do this, God will not hear their prayers. They do not have communication open with God. We need to pre preach that more, I believe. There's a lot of people think, oh, well, you know, I can miss church, and I can do this, I can do that, but I'll just pray the Lord, and everything will be fine. Prayer is a wonderful thing, but it's no substitute for service and duty unto God. Then I think, too, about the precious little ones who perished in this terrible storm. Everything we suffer is not punishment from God. Look at these innocent children. They weren't being punished. Jesus said, Suffer little children and forbid them not to come unto me, for all such is the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 19, 14. We don't have to worry about where their souls are. They're with the Lord. They're in a better place. And if we become as old children and are converted to Christ, come to the kingdom, Matthew 18, 3 to 5, and we remain faithful, one day that's where we will be when we leave this world. But then another great lesson is that death comes to all, young and old alike, rich and poor, it did not matter if it was a half a million dollar house or a little shanty shack or a hut worth a little money. A tornado can destroy any kind of a house. Death comes to everyone. It comes to all. Jesus said, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moths nor earth doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Let's go back again, my friends, to the book of Psalms. This time to Psalm 22. And, ver uh, excuse me, Proverbs 22, verse 2. Proverbs 22, verse number 2. I'd like to read that. This time, the Bible says, <clears throat> The rich and poor meet together. The Lord is the maker of them all. You know, the rich and poor meet together. We meet together when people obey the gospel. We come together in the church. We meet together in death because it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. The rich man and Lazarus both died in Luke 16. And one day we're going to meet together in the day of judgment. One thing that we learn in the wake of a terrible flood or tornado or some other calamity or tragedy, and that is material things don't really matter that much. They don't really matter that much. But being right with God does matter. In helping our fellow man and serving the Lord and giving him the glory, that really matters. Doing God's will. Last of all this morning, we need to realize that God's word is indestructible. You know, it was brought out in the news about people walking away with the Bible that had not been destroyed by the tornado. I don't really believe that necessarily is what the scriptures are saying when it talks about the word of the Lord endureth forever. But the idea is you cannot destroy God's word. You cannot destroy God's word. 
But even if a copy of the Bible is destroyed by a fire or a tornado or a flood, the Word of God still does exist. As Peter said, being born again not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the Word of God which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever, and this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you, 1 Peter 1, verse 23 to 25. We read a while ago in our scripture reading, Matthew 24, verse 35. Jesus said, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. My friends, we need to be ready at any time to meet our Maker, to leave this old world, and to meet the Lord. We need to be ready. Jesus said, Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The Spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Matthew 26, 41. And then we go back to our scripture reading, Matthew 24, verse 42 to 44. The Lord said, Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not the Son of Man cometh. So whether it be in regard to the second coming of Christ, or to our dying and leaving this world, we need to be prepared. We need to be ready to meet the Lord. The prophet Amos said, Prepare, O Israel, to meet thy God. Amos 4, verse 12. 2 Corinthians 6, 2, Paul said, Now is accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. He didn't say tomorrow. But the idea is that today is the day of salvation. When I preached in Portsmouth, Virginia, many years ago, there was a couple in the congregation very fine people and good friends of mine and they had one daughter but before I came to that place to preach their daughter who was a young adult was restored to Christ evidently she had become negligent or unfaithful but she came and was restored to Christ Two weeks later, this young lady lost her life in an automobile accident. Two weeks after being restored to the Lord. Now such a story as this could be repeated many times. No doubt about that. The people who have obeyed the gospel and lost their life the very next day or within a week or two or three. There are many stories like this. But sadly, my friends, there are many stories about individuals who plan to obey the gospel or who plan to come back to Christ but lost their life in an untimely death before they had another opportunity. Let's be sure. Let's give all diligence to make our calling and election sure. If we should have anyone today who needs to return to the Lord like this young lady did to repent and pray God's forgiveness that we might be forgiven, Acts 8, verse 22 to 24, or to come and render obedience to the gospel. We have that opportunity to hear, believe, and obey the gospel like the Corinthians. And many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized, Acts 18, 8. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned, Mark 16, 16. We must come in faith to the Lord, in repentance, Acts 2.38, confessing Jesus Christ, the Son of God, before baptism, Acts 8.37, and then being baptized in water, verse 38 and 39, for the remission of sins, Acts 2.38, that we might rise to walk in unison of life, Romans 6.4, and have the hope of glory with Jesus Christ forever. This morning, if this be your need, we invite and encourage you to come. While us together we stand and we sing. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washing the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour?
are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the blood, in the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you walking daily by the Savior's side? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Do you rest each moment in the crucified? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood in the blood? In the blood of the Lamb, lay aside the garments that are stained with sin, and be washed in the blood of the Lamb. There's a fountain flowing for the soul unclean, oh be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Are you washed in the blood? Cleansing blood of the Lamb. Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? <coughs> Thank you, Brother Dane. It was a fine lesson. Appreciate it. Much needed. Nothing to think about. Prayer our hearts and minds.